Hello, everyone who is, who is joining us from all corners of the world. We are very happy to have you with us. And just before we start our session, uh, we have an important reminder from the organizers. Uh, we would like to let you know that by registering and participating in this event, you agree to abide to the uh, conference anti-discrimination, harassment and retaliation policy. And please, uh, for example, take a copy of, uh, take a photo of this slide. And uh, I think information is also on the conference website that you will be able to, if you should you uh, encounter some of these issues, uh, we do have a plan uh, for you how to move forward. So please take a note of that. And uh, again, welcome everyone. And before we start the session, I would like to first present our presenters. Uh, we are very happy to have with us Tobias Ide from Murdoch University in Australia, who will talk about climate change, disasters and conflict de-escalation. We also have Sophie de Bruin from PBL Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agencies at Rie University Amsterdam, who will speak about projecting long-term conflict risk in response to climate change. And then we have also Florian Lenner from University of Munich, who will talk about climate security nexus in the United Nations Security Council. And last but not least, we have Ben Akala from Maseno University in Kenya, who will talk about coping strategies adopted by refugees to diffuse their vulnerability to climate change and Kakuma refugee camp and to Karna County, Kenya. Because when talking about different issues related to environment, peace and security, it is really important to learn about different specific examples. But before we dive in into presentations, I would really like to ask our presenters, what motivates them to work with these issues? Why have they selected to work with issues related to environment, peace and security? So first, Tobias, why, 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 why environment and peace? Um, yes, I think it all started when I was on a field study trip in Israel and Palestine in 2010 with the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and you, you talk, we talked a lot and saw a lot about tensions around the Jordan River and the quite devastating water situation of quite few Palestinians, which is, of course, primarily a political topic. But then the question is, how can it be addressed and how does climate change enter the field? And I mean, 2010 was a time when climate security was a pretty new field. Um, environmental peace building was just starting to gain pace again. Mm -hmm. So you had this wide yeah. open field connected to, to my experiences during the study trip and it absolutely motivated me to yeah. dive into that. Thank you very much. And Sophie, why do you work with these issues? Well, uh, I'm working in a policy orientated environment. So I work for a research institute, but we do policy, policy orientated research for the Dutch government, for the European Union, for UN organizations. And originally we mostly focus on environmental system interaction scenario studies, uh, such as water systems, food production, climate change, but more and more there is an interest also in the societal, political, uh, and also economic sides and the impact of environments on these systems and even visa, vice versa. And uh, not that I was the first in the field, by far not, but within my, in the institute I work for now, I, I was, and that really motivated me to broaden the horizon of the people I work with and also the policymakers we work with. And also for me, this is, um, yeah, still not really sure what is the most interesting thing to do. I think this is a really interesting field to be in and also a really important field for the coming years. Thank you, Sophie. We are really looking forward to hearing your reflections on long-term long impacts of these issues. And now, Florian, what motivates you and why have you chosen this field? Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's especially interesting um, because we see all these effects today. We see the interaction between climate change and security. We see the nexus today, but we know what's coming. We know exactly, we know all the climate projections and we know that it's not going to get any better just by waiting. We know that it's going to get worse. So um, I feel like as researchers, we now have the opportunity to prevent it might be, it might be a big word in that context, but to actually somewhat anticipate um, and to prepare policymakers um, to actually make a change mm -hmm. when it gets even worse in the future. So I feel like it's a very, it's a very interesting field because it, it has um, very broad implications and important implications now, but also 
for future policy makers. Thank you very much, Florian. We are really looking forward to hearing what you and can do about these issues. And then last but not least, Ben, what motivates you to work with these issues? Ben, are you with us? If you have a technical issue, we can really wait and you can share your reflections when it's your time to present. So if Ben is not joining us immediately, we can definitely hear what motivates you just at the beginning of your presentation. And now we will hear these four presentations. The presenters will have about 10 minutes to uh, present their subject. And already during the presentations, I would really like to encourage you to share your reflections, to share your questions in chat. And after that, we really want to leave enough time for discussion because we see uh, many, everybody who has joined, you are experts in this field as well. So we want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions. We want to hear your follow-up on the presentations. So please be ready. We have really left enough time for discussion. So, and now, uh, Tobias, the floor is yours. We are very much looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Let me just briefly share my screen and in the meantime, take the chance to say, um, uh, um, to say big thank you to um, Martina for chairing the session and to Anna for all the technical support. And just to all the participants, I think we just hit 100 participants, which is amazing for um, an online panel on a conference that has just this, its first repeat second conference at all. So it's really great and I'm delighted to speak at this panel. Um, and the results I am presenting um, basically are derived from a larger three-year project funded by the Australian Research Council uh, on climate change and the dynamics of armed conflicts. Um, and the starting point for this particular presentation and the paper that's underlying um, the presentation is basically that um, I diagnose somewhat of the existence of a climate disaster conflict narrative. Um, and this narrative proceeds in, um, in basically in, 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 in a few steps. So the first one is, I mean, climate change exists um, and it's leading to changes in the hydrometeorological cycle, which I think is beyond doubt. This will, together with other factors like um, poverty, population density, urbanization, and so on, lead to increasing frequency or intensity of disasters like storms, droughts, or floods. This, in turn, will increase uh, the risk for political issues um, like state fragility. Um, for instance, if a state loses income due to um, a GDP loss due to a disaster, um, or if the, the military is so busy with the disaster response that it can't, um, that doesn't have the capacity to, to assist somewhere else, for instance, in fighting an insurgent group. And it will also, of course, um, according to this narrative, at least, increase poverty among the disaster affected population. And this, in turn, will lead to increased conflict risks because we have weaker states and a more poor population that is either more aggrieved or more, more available for recruitment by armed groups and warlords. Um, and I mean, this is, this is a narrative you can find in academia and recent debates about the UN Security Council, think tanks, NGO media, it's pretty widespread. I'm not saying every, each and every person and institution is supporting it, but it's pretty widespread. Um, and I'm saying it, it is for a good reason. So there is evidence for that. And you see on the left side of your screen, you see um, that since the 1980s, the, the numbers and the fatalities and the damage of, of climate-related extreme weather events or climate-related disasters has increased almost across the bench. Um, and there are quite a few studies, uh, both quantitative and qualitative, that indicate this, that indeed climate-related disasters increase um, conflict risk. Uh, I find that in a paper written or published in 2020, together with some colleagues from the Potsdam Institute, so the effect is conditional on factors like ethnic exclusion or poverty. 
Um, but I mean, I'm not the only one in that field and people like Nina von Uxkul, Adrian Detges, Josh Easton, Constantine Ash have, have all forwarded similar results and positions. Um, and as much as I say, there is some truth in this narrative. I'm, I also have a few concerns um, about, about this narrative. Um, and I would say there's one overarching concern which translates into uh, three more specific concerns. So the overarching concern is that the narrative has and the underlying research has a pretty strong state and conflict focus uh, in its ontology. That means when we discuss um, the security implication of climate change, the question is quite often, does it lead to increased conflict risks? Yes or no. Um, and there's very little consideration of the question that it might lead to decreased conflict risk or to chances for peace. Um, and I think we're missing quite a few connection points to the environmental peace building and disaster diplomacy literature here, but we are also um, making the field open to critiques from international relations scholarship, which has widely published on the overly conflict focused um, agenda of peace and conflict research and limited attention to conflict de-escalation and peace. Um, and likewise, it's mostly concerned with impacts on states. So there is state fragility, there are state militaries um, that are strained, there is a state who loses GDP revenues, there are rebel groups who can re re recruit more supporters to mobilize against the state, there are anti-state grievances uh, after a disaster, and so on and so on. And there's very little consideration of how other actors like um, rebel groups, but also pro-state militia, um, are actually affected by, by climate change and climate related disasters. And I think that's an unfortunate for um, academic reason because it does not allow us um, to basically get an overview about all kinds of actors that matter in political and armed struggle and to not assess the diverse security implications of climate change, which can be both um, higher and lower conflict risks and no change in risks, of course. Um, there's obviously a bit of a political risk that we reproduce um, violent imaginations of the places of disaster related conflicts as naturally violent and unable to cope with environmental change. Also, for instance, in, Afri in, in East Africa, there's tons of studies on peaceful adaptation to disasters between rebel groups. Um, and that also fuels into the narratives about fortress Europe and higher military spending. Um, that are problematic for one reason or another. Um, and then from a practical point of view, and there's a very interesting paper from Daniel Abrahams um, recently published in World Development, where he basically shows that a lot of um, practitioners um, in peace building and environmental management um, are more interested in how to make environmental management more peaceful and to make climate resilient peace, but all the literature they could find is on conflict. Um, so we have these concerns and I mean, as I, I argue in the paper that it's very well possible that, that, that climate related disasters impact rebel groups and that they can lead to more peaceful outcomes. I outlined two pathways. One is um, through disaster diplomacy forwarded by people like Ilan Kelman or Laura Peters, who basically argue that um, disasters act as kind of a shared threat that facilitate disaster between, between different groups. And the other one being more constraints to violence, that means disasters just constrain the capability of actors, both rebels and states, to wage violence against each other, leading to tom temporary declines in conflict, which, however, can open up windows of opportunity for, for negotiation or humanitarian uh, aid, for instance. Um, and the paper base, and I mean, this is just like uh, the disasters with more than 4,000 casualties since 1989 that hit conflict areas. And you see actually conflict de-escalation is, is more frequent after disasters, at least in the first 12 months. Um, and I dive a bit into three case studies in the paper, but I will only focus. One is in Bangladesh, one is in uh, Kashmir, and one is in Somalia. And I'm briefly going to present the Somalia case study. Um, no worries, Martina, second to last slide. Um, so Somalia basically um, 
had a civil war that um, was first against rebel groups against the dominant regime and with the fall of the regime in 1991 um, the civil war continued as a struggle between different um, between between different groups or different rebel groups um, and I think at that stage the two most important contestants were both the United Somali Congress they're like two with the same name they split at some point after the, the, the fall of the regime one led by Ali Mahdi and the other one by Mohammed Aidid um, so these two were fighting against each other. And then in um, 1997, we had a significant flood event in southern Somalia, as you can see on the map. Um, and afterwards, as you can see on the top right figure, um, we have, I mean, already a bit before that, but mainly after that, we have a significant decline in, um, in conflict intensity. Um, this is with uh, UCDP data, uh, but it's actually corroborated by, by, by different data sets I used. Um, and that's due to two factors. The one is um, because uh, apart from Mogadishu, the agricultural area in the south was the most uh, the main fighting ground. Um, so with quite a lot of the territory flooded there, people could just no longer move the troops around. So they could not fight for a few months until the floods receded. Um, and the second reason was that um, after the floods, agricultural prices skyrocketed 530% um, for maize and approximately 110% for flour and wheat. Um, and that posed an enormous difficulty for armed groups to feed their fighters, particularly since they were getting most of their revenues from either banana exports, of which 20% had been destroyed by the floods, and cattle exports, but after the floods, there was um, a cattle disease running wild and the neighboring countries banned cattle export. So basically we had two armed groups with um, limited mobility of fighters, lower revenues, and who needed to pay more money to feed their fighter, they had less of capability and obviously the conflict declined, um, at least in, in, in the 12 to 18 months period after the disaster. Um, so what we can learn from, um, from this case study and perhaps the others in the paper is that disasters can indeed be drivers of conflict escalation and they do so by not only affecting states but also rebel groups and non-state actors. That constraints to violence is, is more relevant than, than disaster diplomacy. Um, that certain context factors matter a lot, like the disasters destroying critical infrastructure for troop mobility or um, affecting the revenue sources of the conflict parties. Um, and that therefore, by having a stronger on ontological focus on both peace and non-state groups, most notably insurgents, we can derive innovative new insights for climate security research. Um, my clock says I'm on time, so I leave it here. Thank you all for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Tobias. This was most interesting and I'm, I hope that you will all think of a very interesting questions to Tobias. I would be, for example, interested in understanding what prevented the conflicts. You talked about the escalation between 12 to 18 months, but what really prevented more permanent conflict resolution? What preventing more, prevented more lasting change? What are the indicators? But I'm sure that many of you here have, for example, practical experience with these issues and I would really like to encourage you to share it during the discussion. We really would like to hear from you. And now we will go to Sophie. So Sophie, please tell us more about your long-term impacts. Yeah, um, I will start the presentation first. I can already say that there's, even though we didn't plan it, there's an interesting link between my presentation and the presentation of uh, Tobias. Um, and I also wanted to say that it's really exciting to talk to and with you in this way, because even though we're all at home or at a workplace that we can still interact. I will start the presentation. Um, okay, I will be talking to you about projecting long-term armed conflict risk, especially in the context of climate change and whether or not it's an underappreciated field of inquiry. First, I will talk about uh, why it's so difficult to project armed conflict, 
And in the second part, I will uh, present an example to you where we've tried to actually project armed conflict. There are many reasons why it's so difficult to project armed conflict. There are methodological challenges, uh, and there are also more policy oriented challenges. I will introduce five of these challenges to you first. Yeah, an important one, which you're probably all aware of, is that until now we did find in some studies uh, relations between climate and conflict. But yeah, in studies there, in many studies, these, these associations are different or they change over time. Uh, so that makes it really hard to take these uh, interactions towards the future. A second and related challenge is that uh, data reliability is often weak, especially in very conflict prone regions. So when you want to uh, project quantitatively, this is really an issue. Um, and also related to this data point, there's a very wide combination of factors in different spatial time scales, uh, spatial and time scales. Uh, but only a few of these uh, indicators is available as projection data uh, and also part of this data is really, you can of course maybe develop that data into the future yourself, but it can be really hard to turn that into a specific storyline. Uh, and of course, this is especially the case for quantitative projections, is it really hard to include the big unexpected events such as geopolitical shifts, whereas these are often really important for conflict. And the last uh, issue is that uh, we know that uh, the interplay of drivers is not always constant over time, so that can change. And this is especially also the case for the relation for between uh, uh, climate and conflict. Will that be the same in the future when climate change increases? There are also a number of policy-related or policy-relevant challenges the first one is that the demand for these uh, long-term scenarios is not that high. Of course, the uh, security scenarios are quite often used in uh, security communities or in the military, but not by the international community. I mean, not by the international community as uh, integrated assessment models are. So, of course, in the climate, food, water communities, uh, long-term projections are very often used also to benchmark global goals. This is not the same for uh, conflict projections. And the last uh, dimension is re relates to the yeah, of the short-term and reactive nature of conflict resolution. Of course, there's also a forward-looking uh, aspect, but so mostly only a couple of years. What makes it hard to find the application for these uh, conflict projections? But, these conflict projections can have can be very useful on the one hand in uh, in conflict communities so for conflict prevention and peace building uh, including the climate dimension on the long term and the risk that climate change could pose uh, could broaden and by that improve these kind of projects but that also works uh, the other way around so climate adaptation projects and climate mitigation projects should be uh, improved or broadened at least by uh, long-term views on intersecting risk that can affect these projects. And the last uh, use is more, maybe the, the scientific use is the consolidation of these social economic and environmental scenarios with conflict risk. Because for example, when you project GDP into the future, GDP is very, uh, can be affected by conflict, whereas now we just take uh, growth rates without uh, uh, taking notice of conflict risk. I now present you one case in which we try to project uh, armed conflict risk for towards 2050. We use the shared socioeconomic pathways, which are uh, quite often used scenario approach. Um, and for that, we developed a machine learning model. So first, we estimated the historical uh, relations between hydrochromatic factors and conflict and also other indicators I will later show you uh, and consequently we operationalized a machine learning model to kind of to detect and stimulate these uh, flexible associations. What was a first very important result that when looking uh, back uh, it's easier to predict so this is we predicted the data, uh, uh, test data, training data, 
to it was it is easier to predict regions where there is no conflict or where there's a very high level of conflict. It's really difficult to predict uh, the regions in between. Initially, we found that the hydroclimatic indicators play a minor role in conflict. They do play a role, uh, but uh, other indicators like governance, uh, conflict history, conflict in neighboring countries uh, are more important. And this also uh, is reflected in the current literature. Still, we use these historical relations to project conflict risk into the future. What you see here is conflict risk 2014, 2050 in three different scenarios. The above is SSP1 is a more optimistic scenario, also with lower climate impacts, RSP 2.6, uh, down to uh, SSP3 with RSP 6.0, which is a more negative scenario. And you also see that conflict risk increases um, in, in, in this scenario. Interestingly, we also run the model without the hydroclimatic uh, indicators to see whether or not it always increase, conflict risk always increases according to this model. You see that actually in some regions, conflict risk increases with hydroclimatic indicators, whereas in other regions, conflict risk actually decreases when taking along hydroclimatic indicators. So if you look at the map, uh, the map uh, the right, on the right below, you see that the areas in red, their conflict risk increases with hydroclimatic indicators, this projection at least. Uh, and in the blue areas, conflict risk actually decreases. Uh, so it, this is also what Thomas Eder was talking about, that apparently conflict risk is not, will not always increase according to our model and our data, uh, taking historical relations uh, as, as the basis. Of course, there are so many limitations to project. So first important one is for the study we did is that it's also a scenario-based assessment and that there's really limited data. And also that the quality of the data is sometimes questionable or you can at least discuss the, the quality of that data. And also that there is no real interaction between the socioeconomic and environmental projections. Whereas in reality, of course, socioeconomic developments are affected by environmental projections and vice versa. And of, also we take the historical uh, relations as the basis for future predictions, uh, for no predictions, projections. Um, and the last one um, is that we only uh, assess uh, a one year time lag for the hydrochromatic indicators. And we didn't look at the long-term effects, whereas most likely that will also be very relevant. So this was very briefly, I hope I didn't talk too fast, uh, my presentation and I will uh, switch back to the session. Thank you very much, Sophie. This was most interesting. I know that we have a few decision makers and policy makers among our participants, and I think it would be very interesting later to hear your views, how we can use uh, that type of knowledge and these types of projections in really thinking how do we shape policies to certain regions. Uh, I found it fascinating to see actually your maps, because then when you look at different transboundary river basins and really think about the projections, that can really change the current scenario situation in a maybe you know, that would be very interesting to have a discussion on that. But uh, now we will go to Florian and we will hear more about uh, the United Nations. So Florian, the floor is yours. Yes, I hope you can uh, all see my presentation. Great. Um, yes, thank you very much. So I will take a little bit of an institutional turn here. I will not really focus on the climate security nexus as such, but more on the question, what can policymakers in the Security Council do in order to make sure that all these results are actually properly reflected in international governance on climate change and security. So as we all know, um, non-traditional security issues like climate change and security is sometimes a little bit of a difficult issue in the Security Council, especially because um, states like Russia and China are often focusing on the securitization aspect of it and are not convinced it should actually be discussed. And so we have, we do have certain examples where it has been successful, but we also do have certain examples where it hasn't been successful. And so the question that I was interested in is under which conditions can the E10, because they are mostly the ones uh, suggesting in the inclusion of climate change and security, under which conditions can they actually include language on the climate security nexus, despite opposition by at least one or maybe even several 
um, P5 members. So this paper is a contribution to the literature on decision making in the Security Council and the power of the A10, but equally a contribution to how can we make sure that climate security is reflected in international governance. Um, very briefly on the state of the art, I will not go into detail here, but the problem that I encountered when reading a lot of articles um, about it is that most studies focus on potential factors that allow the E10 to um, to have more or less power, but they don't really they don't really explore um, how and when these factors are actually important. So there's a lack of a clear and generalizable mechanism. Um, there was one article by Otto Nissen and Julio in 2014 where they developed a mechanism um, to try to explain the influence, but they mostly focused on agency and not really on institutional factors, which um, I saw as kind of a problem. So this paper is also trying to do that, find a mechanism that includes both, um, both of these things. In order to do that, I drew on uh, Vivian Schmidt's dispersive institutionalism um, using the ideas of ideational power once in form of power through ideas. So the um, capacity of actors to persuade other actors or convince other actors. And on the other hand, power over ideas, so the ability to impose your own ideas on other actors. And that is combined with institutional power from a very institutionalist perspective. Um, so formal and informal institutions as a systems of rules or practices that then influence and shape the interaction between all the actors involved in the process. And this basically led me to conclude this mechanism of how um, climate change and security can actually make it into peacekeeping resolution. Um, so first of all, it is that some member has to propose a certain paragraph on the issue. Then they use power through ideas to build broad coalitions and convince as many members as possible um, that it's actually a necessary issue. Then the next step is by um, convincing more and more actors, this also increases the pressure on opposing actors, in this case, the P5 members. Um, and then you can also use ideation elements in order to pressure them into changing their perspective. And that's also when institutional power kicks in because then, especially as pen holder in the Security Council, you are the one to be responsible for the inclusion of something in a resolution. And so all of these things together combined diminish the opportunities for actors opposing climate change and security language in a certain resolution um, and kind of compels them to negotiate concessions, which at the end of the day leads to climate and security being included in the resolution. Um, so how can we observe this? First of all, we need to see, are there actually the ideation elements supporting the claim? Is, is there evidence? And has this evidence been used? Um, then other members, of course, need to be convinced. Other members need to be pressured, um, which we can see if um, there's a shift in priorities. Um, then institutions, that's the institutional power aspect of it, like the penholder uh, pen system, um, which then grants certain actors more power over the negotiations than others. And then when actors start to negotiate concessions, then we see that all of this has actually been a progress. Quickly on the methodology of the paper, it's been based on process tracing um, and the results are generalizable generally to non-traditional security issues that have a similar kind of um, problematic in the Security Council. So for instance, also sexual and reproductive health care is also something um, that member states sometimes, or like P5 members sometimes oppose equally. Um, but it is not generalizable for thematic resolutions, only focusing on the climate security nexus. For instance, just at the end of last year, one of those resolutions failed um, because of one veto. Um, and it's also not generalizable to instances where it's not a P5 member because then, yeah, the veto power is just lacking. So now uh, focusing on the results, because that's the most important and interesting, interesting part. I focused on two cases. One, the case of MONUSCO in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and uh, second, the case of UNMIS in South Sudan. In the case of MONUSCO, um, it was successful. Language on climate change security was included. In the case of UNMIS, it failed. And so now we're going to explore why this was the case. Um, so here are the results from UNESCO. France was the pen holder. Germany proposed the language. Um, and it was successful because they had ideational and institutional power, as I will argue. Um, first of all, there have been reports by the regional office in Central Africa, UNOCA, um, that confirmed the climate security nexus for the DRC. And there's also, there have also been statements by the president of the DRC at the 74th UNGA 2019, outlining that climate change will be an overarching issue affecting all policy areas. 
um, which then of course also includes um, security. And I conducted 10 interviews for this paper with representatives in the Security Council, and they confirmed that these elements were very important in order to convince and exert pressure on other member states of the Security Council. In the second stage, um, two member states have been convinced to support the proposal. Um, those were um, Cote d'Ivoire and uh, Equatorial Guinea, because they only supported the German proposal after some amendments uh, suggested by the United States under the Trump administration, um, that needs to be said, um, were included. But they were also not opposed to the issue beforehand, so no political pressure was necessary. Then, sorry, there's a lot of text, but I will narrow it down. Um, for Russia and China, for both of them, um, geopolitical interests, resource interests, also um, alliances with many African states at the United Nations are very important. So for them, as soon as we um, had the evidence from the president of the DRC, for instance, arguing that climate change will be an overarching issue, other states in, um, in the region also supported the issue. It was very hard for them to still oppose because you can't really oppose if the host nation is in favor of it. That was different for the United States because they wanted the so-called Force Intervention Brigade and they also uh, didn't want the ICC to be mentioned. So they kind of had to focus on other things and focus their resources on that. And that is also reflected by the language on climate change and security being already agreed upon three to four days in advance. France as the penholder used their power because they included it in, um, in the resolution and despite US opposition, they still managed to keep it in. And in a final step, then um, vetoing, um, vetoing the resolution would have been very difficult for the United States to justify because it was about a peacekeeping mission that has been going on for years and years and years. So that was politically not very feasible. An abstention would maybe express dissatisfaction, but it wouldn't change the text. So the only way for the United States under the Trump administration um, to make sure climate change is not as prominent of an issue in the language um, was to negotiate concessions. And that's what they did. They tried to water down the um, paragraph by adding lots of other stuff like energy security, um, which they couldn't really argue was directly related to, to the issue at hand. Second example, very briefly, was the case of UNMIS. In this case, it was the United States. Again, I have to stress this all the time under the Trump administration. This is not the case under the Biden administration. Um, the United States was the pen holder. Germany proposed the issue here as well. But now Germany and other proposing states only had limited ideational power and basically no institutional power which um, led to failure in the end. So what we had before, reports mentioning um, the nexus of climate and security, they were lacking. There were no SRSG reports or reports to the Secretary General that specifically mentioned climate change. And there was also no support from the government of South Sudan. There was, however, a USAID report on the impact of climate change and security, but that was the only one linking it. And Germany um, tried to use that, but um, it didn't convince enough members um, but some like at least one member um, i could find out was convinced that was indonesia because they usually always emphasize that it has to be assessed on a case by case basis and eventually they supported the proposal so they have been convinced that climate change and security is an important issue in south sudan as well um, but there was not as much power over it is because um, the negotiations were less contested. The United States um, was the pen holder. They were less distracted. They were less focused on other issues, which allowed China to be neutral and Russia to um, focus on other issues as well. And then again, a lot of text. Um, but the important difference here is that the United States rejected two German proposals. The first German proposal saying that climate change and ecologic, ecologic changes do affect the stability of South Sudan. The second saying that they may have effects on the stability of South Sudan. Both were rejected by the United States, which shows that they used their institutional power to um, avoid climate change and security in general. So in the final step in this case, it was vice versa. So the room uh, for maneuver for proposing states was limited. Either veto was not possible because uh, it's in 10 member state or it was politically hardly feasible for UK and France. An abstention equally as for the United States would um, lead to the acceptance of the text. So the only way to have climate change in there is to uh, negotiate concessions. And at the end of the day, what, uh, what happened was that there was a very brief paragraph included without mentioning climate change as such, but just very vaguely touching on the topic. So um, last slide to conclude, 
Um, what do policymakers need to make sure? They need to make sure that they have the evidence to support their claims. They need to make sure that they use the evidence to build coalitions. Um, to they need to make sure they are engaged, so they have the institutional power, so they have to find coalitions to be the pen holder and be engaged in the negotiations um, and take their own responsibility. Um, if they don't do that, if they have neither of these powers, they will very likely fail if there is an ideologically opposed state like the United States on the other on the other, on the other side of the aisle. Um, and also, if they only have one form of power, um, there are also indications in my research that that will most likely not be sufficient. So at the end of the day, um, my, my advice to policy makers would be collect evidence, make sure um, you, you have all the necessary um, documents to show everyone that climate change and security is an important issue, um, and then engage, and that might give you more leverage to actually uh, make a change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian. Again, another really interesting presentation. It would be very interesting to learn a little bit more about the dynamics between the elected 10 and how they work together with the P5. And if we have anybody here from, from the audience who would also like to share some perspectives on this, again, very welcome. Uh, we will now go to the last presentation, but I would like to ask you all of our participants if you would already now like to share your questions and maybe reflections, because we will open the floor after our last presentation from Ben. So, and now, without any further ado, uh, Ben, the floor is yours, and we will hear from you about one very specific case, how climate change impacts uh, refugees in Kenya. And if you would also like, at the beginning, share your uh, reflections on why, what motivates you to work with this subject, you are also very welcome to do so. I, we may be having some technical issues. As I said, Ben is joining us from Kenya and we were able to connect to him before, just as we were waiting for the session to start. So I, I hope we will be successful again and we will be able to hear from him about this very interesting case, something very practical, very specific. So we can give him a few minutes, it may be while we are waiting for Ben, I would like to ask Sophie and Tobias, do you have any reflections on Florian's presentation when hearing about these dynamics within the UN Security Council? And in light of the topics that you presented, what would be your, uh, do you have any immediate uh, thoughts or reflections or even questions to Florian? So, Sophie, you, you, you are muted yourself first. So please yes, go. yes. Yeah, well, Florian, thank you for your presentation. And you told us a little bit about how in, um, in some cases, the climate security dimension gets included, whereas in, so, in some others, uh, it's not the case. Um, can you tell me or us a little bit more about what it actually means, what, what actions uh, follow from uh, climate security being included in a mission or in a project, but what that practically, practically would mean. Thank you. And maybe we also call a question from Tobias and then we will go to Florian. Thank you, Sophie. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting because I feel your idea of ideational power make me think about where does this ideational power come from. And I mean, you mentioned evidence that is present for certain cases and others not. So we as researchers as an epistemic community seem to have at least a minor role. I was also wondering whether to consider media or the public like these um, like, like, like climate demonstrations, um, Fridays for Future and other stuff, whether they can factor in this ideational power and how you basically deal with changing, let's say, the broader public opinion, media context underlying the discussion, how that feeds into UN Security Council debates. Should I answer to both questions now? Yes, please do, Florian. Thank you. Yes, um, great. Thank you both so much for these questions. Very, very good questions. And um, one was also um, a, one. I think I think your question, uh, Sophie, is pretty much the same as the one in the chat. 
Um, so I'm going to com combine those. So why is it why is it important and why worth the effort? Um, so at the end of the day, um, what we have seen so far is mostly that it was because resolutions have kind of two parts. First of all, it's like the preambular part, and then it's the part that actually influences what happens on the ground. And so far, in most of these resolutions, it's a preambular paragraph. So it doesn't really have any implications for policymaking yet, but that can change. Um, it, at the moment, um, in many cases, it has symbolic value. And then the precedent that I would like to, that I would like to make everyone aware of is the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Because we have resolution 1325 in the year 2000, which basically changed a lot for the work of the United Nations Security Council and has ever since had a considerable impact on the work also of the United Nations on the ground. So I think it has to be in terms of working towards a thematic resolution like the resolution on WPS, um, which then would maybe help mainstream climate change and security in the work of the Security Council and also on the ground and help include it in more, um, yeah, in more um, sort of on the ground paragraphs um, of, of these missions. And then um, to, to answer Sophia's question, um, so I would say the research as such, but also media attention doesn't necessarily directly affect what the Security Council does because it's a very sheltered kind of system. Um, but what affects um, these discussions most is, um, is evidence that is provided by the United Nations itself. So reports by a special representative on the ground, reports to the Secretary General, for instance. So a lot of stuff that the UN um, Secretary General produces itself. Um, so what I, would, what I would suggest is as researchers, but also as activists, um, create awareness, get in touch with policymakers, because then these policymakers will maybe be able to draw on your insights to include it in, for instance, a report to the Secretary General, in, for instance, a report by the special representative, which then will be considered as a legitimate source in the Security Council. So it's kind of an indirect way, but influencing um, the, the UN system um, through these kind of UN documents and reports is, I think, the most promising way forward. They will also be actively looking to academia, or aren't they? Is that something you really have to hand towards them? Otherwise, it will not land. That's a difficult question for me to, to, to answer. Um, but as far as I understood, yes, they are. So there's definitely, um, especially in the delegations, they are always trying to find new evidence. Um, but it also has to be kind of legitimate. That's also why they tried to um, use the USAID paper in in the case of UNMIS, because it was actually by a US federal agency. Um, yeah. But I think a lot of people are actually interested in are trying to make it to make a difference. So getting in touch with people at the Security Council might be a promising way forward. Thank you very much, Tobias. And now we will hear from a reflection from Hans Olaf Ibrek from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who I believe has a lot to say about this issue. So how Hans Olaf, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martina. I didn't uh, want to uh, take the floor, but as an ETM, uh, I can just uh, would like to send a message uh, to my colleagues uh, as researchers that we definitely use uh, scientific uh, research and evidence wherever we can find it. So. That's the only way to make the case, uh, Florian. So at least, uh, but I, I was intrigued by uh, your two case studies and I can form, confirm that uh, your analysis is spot on. This is the way it actually works, uh, but the only way at least uh, for us to make the case, considering the fact that there are different views in the council on this uh, file, um, as they call it in the Security Council, um, so the only way to convince them is actually that we need to back up whatever we are saying with good scientific work and research, and that's what we are actively searching for. The problem is, of course, that uh, academic liter literature has different views on this, and it's also then uh, easy for uh, our colleagues to use uh, uh, some of this information selectively, and that's uh, happening if you look at some of the statements uh, being made. Uh, without mentioning the country, at least you can look at the inclusion of climate and security in NDCs. There are two studies, one from uh, CIPRI and one from the climate security mechanism that conclude in, in a different manner. 
and that that one has been or those who have been selectively used in the council as arguments uh, by one uh, member um, uh, and it's also important for us to back it up exactly what you were saying by statements by the country because that was actually what convinced uh, the members uh, in the case of Cyprus, UNFISIP, and uh, UNAMI Iraq, uh, which we look upon sort of our wins. And uh, uh, if we hadn't backed that up with statements from the countries, we would not have been able to get that uh, adopted in, in the council. And then at the end of the day, uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, since I'm a bureaucrat, uh, I'm not really familiar with all those uh, scientific words uh, that you used and all those theories. Uh, but I can say that at the end of the day, we are also being traded away uh, when it comes to the various red lines that the various parties uh, have. And that's something we just have to accept uh, that in the final minutes, uh, we as E10 have limited power compared to the P5s. But, my, my message to you, my scientific uh, research colleagues, uh, we definitely use your work and we need it. That's the only way to convince those that uh, we have not been able to convince yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans Olaf. Thank you very much for these very valuable reflections and also for joining us. And I think your message is very valuable here for uh, our colleagues from the research community, because this is exactly what we need. We need this dialogue between uh, decision makers, bureaucrats and the research community. So thank you again for joining us and for sharing these insights. And now I will give the floor to Tobias, and then we will also start turning to questions from the chat. And we are still making efforts to connect to Ben in Kenya. So in the meantime, we will continue with our discussion. So Tobias, please, the floor is yours. Um, yes, two brief comments. Amanda, the first is uh, great to hear that, Hans Olaf. Um, I really, I, I'm really glad to hear you draw on that. Uh, however, and that's my second point, I also tell you that it's not the case for all decision makers and all bureaucrats. So I recently engaged in a consultancy on climate change and migration. I won't tell you with whom, but I was constantly pushed to um, reveal evidence or look for statements that um, overestimate the risk of climate change induced international migration for political purposes. And I think there's also um, more, uh, let's say, um, sociological research by there's a recent paper by Jan Selby on this on how the UN Security Council and other actors discussed climate security climate crisis uh, climate change in the Lake Chad region um, where he also reveals that a lot of evidence is drawn and very selectively um, to further political interest um, so Hans Olaf it's great to hear that, 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 that you're looking for the research and taking that into account but we take can't take it for granted that it's the case every time Thank you very much, Tobias, for saying this. Of course, these are also important aspects, and we really have to think how can the research community really uh, support those decision makers who really do want to listen, and how we can make a stronger case for those who really then cannot pretend that they are not listening anymore. So thank you really for saying this. And now, as you can see, we are here or joined by Ben. Ben, I, we see your presentation. Are you able to, 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 can we hear you? Can you say something, Ben? Then we, we cannot hear you. Maybe and, now. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Ben. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. If you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thanks. I, I will take you through the coping strategies adopted by refugees to diffuse the vulnerabilities of climate change by the uh, Kakuma refugees. I think I will start by giving a brief background, then a problem that exists in Kakuma, and then also review the objectives, the methodology, and the, 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 the Kakuma refugee situation. I'll give a sample profile, and finally, I'll go to the coping strategies which have been adopted by refugees to diffuse their vulnerability to climate change. 
So just to start, I want to state that climate change uh, stresses various environments and fuels serious refugee crises. Unfortunately, most of these refugees are located in the Asals, like in Kenya, in Kakuma, even in Palestine, they are found in arid and semi-arid lands. They are, however, sensitive to vulnerabilities of climate change. Unfortunately, they can't access migration as an option to their environmental problems. They are faced with the serious droughts, floods, insecurity, and many other vulnerabilities which haunt them day by day. Uh, at present, the UN our United Nations High Commission on Refugees and NGOs uh, contribute in taking care of the refugee problems and they do the management process of all activities at the Kakuma refugee camp. However, this uh, paper argues that the most serious problems in Kakuma are the drinking water, the, the climate is quite harsh, and the security of the area. Therefore, it goes further to argue that the refugee crisis being a broad historical and political pro program, problem, the refugees have hardly been given priority in terms of even national policies, national budget, very little is planned for the management of refugees, except for the UNHCR's support. The Kakuma refugee camp operates in at excess capacity in Kenya, and you find that we have quite a number of people who are vulnerable in that area. Basically, we have the orphaned, the disabled, the children, the old, and the many others who need exceptional help, but they remain in the camp just like that. Now, drinking water is provided by the camp, but it is not palatable because it's often warm. There is thermal pollution there, both indoor and outdoor. There is also ex serious insecurity issues emanating from the refugees, inter-refugees, between refugees themselves from different nationalities, as well as with the local host to Rukana communities. Unfortunately, again, we experience serious resource shortages, which culminate to serious conflicts. And these conflicts end up threatening the lives and survival of the refugees. Therefore, this paper endeavored to look at the following. Drinking water, treatment, and the vulnerability to climate change to microclimate creation and vulnerability to climate change impacts, and finally security enhancement and vulnerable to climate change impacts. Kakuma as a study, as an area, is around 120 kilometers from Lodwa, which is the, capital, the, the headquarters of Trukana County in Kenya. It was established in 1991 to host 8,000 refugees, but it's operating above capacity by hosting more than 197,000 refugees. Mal malnutrition, health problems, housing, food shortages, thermal pollution, insecurity, injustice, inadequate education, and unemployment are serious problems facing the camp. The are also several hard hit vulnerable groups which I've mentioned earlier, but uh, as at now, it is managed generally by the UNHCR and other NGOs that you can see listed on the screen there. The Kenya Refugee Act also of 2007 has gone far ahead in trying to uh, address the problems of the refugees. Unfortunately, their lands where they stay is not very good for greater reasons. I think the methodology is a little bit uh, lengthy, but I'll just note that uh, refugees who are interviewed for this were the ones who had stayed in that area for 10 years so that they were able to understand the logistics and the real problems of the camp and various methods were used to look at whatever it was. 
Coming to the results, you find that most of the refugees who were interviewed had, had serious vulnerabilities. You find that the vulnerability level is 99% according to that level. And you find that most of them, they also have, most of them have low levels of education, probably because they have not had an opportunity in their countries to go through formal education and they're always on the run. And given the low levels of education, the occupation levels are also very low. I would also therefore say that this uh, study or rather this paper preferred the coping strategies rather than adaptation strategies because the coping strategies are often short term and immediate and they're oriented toward the survival of these people. And they're also continuous or rather spontaneous. And they are motivated by the crisis, a crisis like the one which the refugees find themselves in. And it's promoted by lack of alternatives. So why is coping the most appropriate strategy for the Kakuma refugees? This is because the Kakuma refugees live one day at a time. They may not know about the future. They're also faced with the dire resource scarcities. And you find that all the activities are demand driven. They look for what they want at that particular time. And they have serious crises and vulnerabilities, which are at the moment. I also want to report that the alternatives for the refugees are not there as at now. Now, these listed here are just but the ranked vulnerable groups in, in the Kakuma refugee camp. And you, as you can see, refugees living with the disabilities, ranging from the hearing impairment to self-help care, rank number one as the most vulnerable group there. The rest of the groups are ranked up to 12. Now, these are long table showing the direct and indirect climate change aggravated vulnerabilities and their respective refugee initiated coping strategies. I'll look at only one or two. Like for example, for the disabilities, the people with the disabilities, you find that they, the magnitude is 98.3%. And you find that their coping strategy is that they get direct care and assistance from families and from humanitarian assistance. If I move like to the, I'll just look for the, look at the first three. We have low levels of awareness. You find that whenever the disaster is, or rather is to strike the camp, people are not aware and the communication systems are weak. So you find that the residents, the residential blocks and humanitarian assistance try to enhance the, uh, dissemination of information. Now that's a continuation of the table. Coming now to the, vulner the, the, the coping strategies, the first coping strategy adopted by the refugees is the drinking water treatment or the management criteria, which run from the drawing of the water, cooling of water and storage of water. As you can see, at the Kakuma refugee camp, the refugees have designed simplified cost-effective strategies of drawing, cooling, and storing water. I want to note that with all these three uh, uh, slides given here, the water treatment process is carbon-free. So it is geared towards the zero net carbon emission as witnessed at the COP26 conference. Another serious issue which uh, ails the camp is what we call the climate or the thermal pollution. So for the thermal pollution, the coping strategy is creating microclimate. And this microclimate is created both indoor and outdoor. So first of all, they have improvised ventilation in their rooms, which of course can't be seen from this slide, unfortunately. They have also improvised ceiling and sideboards for their houses, which are constructed by iron sheets. They also paint their houses white, and they also practice agroforestry, 
which also uh, reduce, sorry, which increases the carbon sink. So at this particular moment, uh, juncture, it is clear that improving ventilation, improvised selling and sideboards, painting houses white, and agroforestry and the green energy uh, approaches or other strategies are also strategies which are climate change or other environmentally friendly and they enhance uh, the welfare of the refugees. The third coping strategy is geared towards insecurity and it entails enhancing the security of the refugees. This has been done through intermarriages, intermarriages among the refugees themselves and with the local communities. They also conduct joint activities in the area between them themselves, the refugees, as well as the host communities. They also do fencing around their homes using dead and alive uh, prosopis, urifora trees, which are resistant and which thrive in the desert, sorry, in the assets, although they have their own limitations. And finally, they construct levees around their homes to avoid flooding in their houses during uh, rain seasons. Now, this paper concludes that refugees find themselves in a foreign and hardship country, but unfortunately, the vulnerable they are vulnerable to climate change, and most of the vulnerabilities lead to their, sorry, are more serious for the handicapped people, the poor, and the orphaned. So the drinking water treatment, which they try to use to cool water so as to be palatable, is limited by various uh, economic costs. Improvised ceilings and sideboards are also helping but they enhance other issues because of the scarcities. And the prosopis urifora agroforestry creates a microclimate, but it is an invasive weed which ends up worsening life for the refugees. And finally, the, the coping strategies enhance their sustenance, self-esteem, and freedom needs as they live in Kakuma. The paper recommends that it is important to identify and support the most vulnerable groups among the refugees. We should be able to avail enough materials or other equipment for cooling, drinking water. There is need also to enforce compliance to the housing at Kakuma to meet the habitat pool requirements. And also there is need to introduce alternative plants or rather trees to replace the invasive urifora trees so that the impacts of these trees are not felt. It is also important to beef the internal and in, in external security by harmonizing uh, the refugees and the host communities. And therefore, given that, it is important that at all times, the refugees' welfare is always upheld in order to meet their sustenance, self-esteem, and freedom needs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ben, and we are very happy that we can have you with us, uh, that you were able to join at last. Uh, thank you for this. I, I and, see now we have a few. And... Yes, we have already a few questions in chat. Uh, many of you ask about the presentations. I can say that uh, this session is being recorded, so you will be able to play this session. And uh, maybe I would also encourage you, you can reach out to the different presenters directly and ask them if they would be able to share the presentation with you. I know that the presentations will not be available at the conference site, but because we are recording the session. So then, and then, then you will be able to get it maybe directly from the presenters. So now I would like to open that. We do have many questions. We actually have one question from the past, and that was really uh, related to the discussion on the UN, and maybe that's a connection with uh, cases from the ground. And there was one question, what's the implication of all these discussions on climate and security on the ground? And also was the communication between UN Security Council and uh, UN uh, uh, Peace Building Commission. So who would like to take that question? 
maybe is it uh, would you like to start Florian and then we can we can maybe move to and uh, hear uh, some reflections from Tobias and Sophie and then and then we will collect more questions so uh, Florian the floor is yours yeah absolutely um thank you so much for these for these questions um so the change on the ground um is one thing i also tried to to answer a little earlier with, uh, with another question um it is very difficult um because in many cases it is about preambular paragraphs that are mostly about the framing of the mission but not really about what's happening on the ground there have also been other instances where that where it has actually made it to um, operational paragraphs for instance i think it was the um MINUSMA extension for Mali in either 2018 or 2019. I think it was 2018. Um, but I didn't, in my research, I didn't really assess the impact on the ground. So that is something that I, unfortunately, I don't really have evidence on. Um, but if other people have more experience with that, then I, I would be very interested to hear about that as well. Um, and about the interaction between um, the, the member states and the UN Peace Building uh, Commission. Um, unfortunately, also something I can't really tell a lot about because I focused on peacekeeping in my research um, and peace building missions uh, always operate a little bit differently. Um, so I didn't really look at peace building, but what I can say is that in the case of peace building, we do have similar issues. Um, and two mandates that I can refer you to is uh, once the uh, UNAMI mission in Iraq and UNAMA in Afghanistan. Um, in both cases, um, member states have tried to include climate change and security as well. Uh, in the, I think in the UNAMA case, um, oh no, sorry, in the UNAMI case, the United States was the penholder, so it didn't work out. And in the UNAMA case, um, even though Germany and Indonesia uh, were the penholders, uh, the co penholders, uh, it still didn't work out um, because there was a very, very bi a huge bilateral fight between the United States and China. Um, which distracted everyone from talking about uh, climate change and security. So that's what I can say about that. Um, I unfortunately don't have evidence about the interaction with the Peace Building Commission. Thank you very much, Florian. And Tobias, do you have reflections? And I also saw that you asked Ben a question. And then we do have uh, two questions in the chat for Ben. So we will give first floor to Tobias, and then I will ask uh, maybe Ben to be ready. And after Ben, we will take reflections from Sophie. So Tobias, the floor is yours now. Yeah, basically Florian made, made quite a quite a few good points. So I think there's little interaction with the, the, the peace building committee. Um, I think there is some interaction with the peace building community, um, like the people who train the peace builders and on the ground. Um, but this is also prevented by a bit of a silo approach. So usually you have the peace building people, you have the climate change adaptation people, you have the disaster risk reduction people, and there's limited interaction between them. But, but even if they interact, usually funding is earmarked for one of those purposes not multiple so it's, it's not it, it's quite a challenge from what i get um perhaps practitioners want to correct me but it's what i what i get um it, it's pretty tricky to integrate these issues thank you tobias and now we had questions from ben so ben uh, there was a question what coping which coping strategies do come directly from the refugees there was also a question on religion that was included in your table uh, in which way religion helps refugees in the camp? Maybe some interesting uh, reflections on that. Uh, I know, especially related to water, there could be some parallels that we can make. And then also asking you about uh, what's the water temperature, the only issue with the water or were there other contaminants that were treated by this innovative system? So if you can then please uh, uh, give us your reflections on these questions. Okay, thank you so much, uh, moderator. The climate at Kakuma is quite high and uh, the water which is supplied is not contaminated because it's provided by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. However, the water temperatures are quite high and therefore more often than not, they don't quench the thirst. So because of that, the local communities have improvised a simple water cooling technology whereby they use wet rugs and then they uh, fix it or they tie it around a jerry can of 20 liters 
so that it is a kind of insulation kind of process so that when the water is inside there, then they wet the rugs, the water cools down and in so doing, it is better because they do not use refrigerators which emit uh, greenhouse gases. And that is therefore one of the coping strategies which emanate from the refugees. Secondly, the security of the camp, for example, is not, it's not that it does, is not there. It is run by the, internally by the UNHCR, as well as the Kenya police, but it is not adequate. We have other issues like uh, domestic violence, women harassment, raping of children, and therefore the communities, the, the refugees have come up with their own conflict resolution mechanisms among refugees whenever there is conflict between different refugees and from different nationalities. And when it comes to food, the ration provided by the UNHCR is often quite little in terms of food, fuel, and even water time and again. So for that particular reason, the refugees have also improvised their own way of doing some business at the Kakuma town, or they also plant a little bit of uh, agricultural crops uh, through irrigation supported by the UNHCR. They also, unfortunately, poach some resources in terms of fuel wood from the, Kakuma, sorry, from the host community. And that one sometimes breeds a lot of uh, friction and conflict between the refugees and the host community. And it is because of that, that they have come up with their own a coping strategy by creating friendship and cultivating a harmonious relationship between them as the refugees and, and, and the people. However, hello? Yes, please hello. continue, Ben. Yeah, so I was therefore saying, so they have come up with their own coping strategy of working together with the local community to complement, not to substitute, but to complement the existing uh, conventional security systems which are there. But on the water temperature, unfortunately, at the time of the study, uh, it was an oversight. I didn't take the water temperature at uh, that particular point in time, but I think it is something I should give serious attention to when it comes to maybe a review or rather further uh, improvement of this paper. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. And I think there was also, there were actually two questions about the religion. Would you like to just share a few reflections on that? A religion. Now, mm -hmm. the religion, uh, these refugees come from different nationalities and they're of different religions, ranging from the Protestant, and that is the Christians and the Muslims. So religion has therefore, at the camp, become the most important unifying factor and the most important uh, uh, component for channeling humanitarian services to the, the refugees in general, but in particular to the vulnerable groups. So you find that the religion or the churches, if I may now be more particular, the churches and the mosques have therefore become conflict resolution centers, especially for the domestic problems and other social problems like uh, the ones I talked about, gender harassment, helping the handicapped, the old. You'll note that when the refugees come to the camp, are brought to the camp, some children lose their parents. They're not even there with their parents. So they, and sometimes they don't even speak the language which can be understood. So you find that the churches become the first uh, points which try to identify these vulnerable groups and ad, uh, accord them the necessary assistance in all that they do. So in a nutshell, religion seems now therefore to be the most uh, important coping strategy for climate change. Because when it comes to even to floods and all other information about climate change, the information is disseminated through churches so that people can be able to know when we are going to have floods, when we are going to have droughts, and so forth and so forth. 
So I really say religion is a very central factor in Kakuma refugee camp. Thank you very much, Ben, for this clarification. We also see here in chat that Silke shared the, her, uh, a link to an article about the important role of youth with coping strategies. So thank you very much, Silke, for sharing that. And we also had a reflections from Maria in chat about uh, practices of Danish refugee councils. Thank you also for that. And then I think I will now invite Sophie to give her reflections on this debate. And when you hear these uh, reflections, what what does it? Um, what how do you reflect on the long term strategy, and uh, the, how does it link to your research? Well, uh, the long. When... Sorry, Ben, go ahead. Is it Ben or uh... Uh, we now? I, I go. Would... Yeah, we were just now going to hear from Sophie, but uh, we can give you the floor afterwards, Ben. And I would like to encourage the other participants, if you please do share your more questions and reflections, you are also very welcome to take the floor. If somebody would really like to make an intervention and make a direct comment, please raise your hand and I'd be very happy to give you the floor. But now we will hear from Sophie. Yeah, well, I can't uh, really reflect, I think, on the long term strategy in the specific project Ben was talking about, so maybe he can elaborate uh, on it, but uh, I was just still thinking about the uh, action of the United Nations Security Council, because I actually, uh, one example was popping into my mind, the UN some mission, and actually in that mission there is specific uh, focus on further farmer conflicts, on land competition, on uh, on insurgent groups and people who join these groups who are affected by climate change related poverty. Um, and actually in, in this mission, there is a focus also on uh, climate change and maybe broader environmental degradation, but uh, also but also, also in this uh, mission specifically, it's a really good example that it's really reactive and not so focused on the long term or not focused at all on the long term and uh, on anticipating beforehand on the risks that may come and not the risk for next year, but really the long term risks. So I think in that way, the long term perspective can still really add to a mission like that, even though I've never been to Somalia. So I can't say uh, myself uh, what is the so is what specifically for Somalia is the best way to do it. But this notion of long term is really missing and could really add to yeah, missions like that. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. Uh, before we get more questions or before I ask my questions, would some of the presenters like to share reflections? I think that now we are discussing whether climate change can be a driver for peace or if it's really a driver for conflict. And I think here we heard very nuanced views and we can really argue both cases. And I think that is important to really say that there are many different aspects of this debate. And the more stories you share and the more cases we hear about and reflections from practitioners and also from all of you who work on the ground, it's very valuable to advance this debate. So we still have eight minutes and we would really like to hear from you. So please do not hesitate to share your views. And I see from uh, we have a hand up from George. So George, I will like to give you the floor and then we will go to Floria. So George, can you please briefly introduce yourself? Tell us uh, uh, your affiliation. My name is George Injaparita. I work with Veritas Global, a Geneva-based economics and strategy advisory and think tank. So thank you for an excellent discussion and really top-notch set of presentations. Um, generally, experts' assessments suggest that when we look at historical drivers of armed conflict, climate impacts are a factor, but probably not the main driver of armed conflict. Some of the main drivers are socioeconomic. But climate impacts and climate policies influence these factors, and it really is through those channels that uh, you know, the impacts can be significant on armed conflict. Uh, our panelists spoke quite a bit about the impacts of climate change, but could you, dear panelists, uh, also perhaps share your thoughts on how responses to climate policies can influence some of the underlying drivers of conflict? Uh, do you think that's a, that's an important factor? So, you know, responding to climate change, changing economic policies, how will that translate to impacts on some of the socioeconomic drivers? Is that a factor that we should be cognizant of and, and, and keeping in mind in our research? 
Thank you very much, George. And now we will go to Florian and then we will hear reflections from the other presenters. And then uh, we would like to get more questions in. So Florian, please. Um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to share a quick uh, reflection because I was also thinking about um, all these resolutions um, that I read for, for my paper and um, especially reflecting on uh, also what to, to be as has said before. Um, mostly focus on climate change as a driver of conflict, but not as a driver of peace. So maybe that's also something practitioners can take away from this. Maybe it's also worth thinking about um, how can how can climate change be viewed in peacekeeping or peace building missions as something that can maybe well, like the effects of which can maybe even be used or implemented in some way, shape, or form um, to build peace and not only see it as a threat. Uh, just a reflection because. As far as I've seen it, that hasn't really been reflected in any resolutions. It's been mostly treated as a driver of conflict. Thank you, Florian. That's an important point. We actually did hear that in a number of transboundary river basins, the perception of shared risk actually motivated countries to start the dialogue or to maybe really discuss uh, longer term impacts of cooperation. So thank you for highlighting this important point. And now we will go to Tobias. Um, just wanted to briefly respond to George, George, I think um, your question is, is pretty much to the point. It, it, it's, um, it's a very important question and I, I might even go to so far to say that the peace and security implications of climate change adaptation and mitigations are perhaps one of the big next research frontiers in climate security and environmental peace building research because on, on the, I mean on the one hand, there are quite a few synergies, right? So if we implement um, agricultural systems that are climate sensitive and that can um, survive and provide livelihoods in a changing climate, um, it's obviously quite good climate change adaptation, but then if we do so in post-conflict contexts, we know that former members of militias or, or warlords or rebel groups are far less likely to return um, to join violent groups again if they have sufficient agricultural income. <clears throat> so, and then, but I mean, then on the other hand, and I mean, that's that's um, the, the more pessimistic view on that is that all over the world we have these large scale projects going on in terms of irrigation that profits large landowners and the ones who are already rich and actually marginalizes smallholders who suffer from growing groundwater levels, for instance. Um, we have biofuels or large solar parks which benefit investors but but really displace local populations which i mean it's not necessarily leading to these kind of civil wars armed conflicts we often think about but it can lead to considerable local insecurity and protests um so i think there are both sides to that it's really an emerging and quite important research frontier Thank you, Tobias. Sophie, would you like to include your reflections? And maybe do you have any final comments on this discussion? Do you have any recommendations for decision makers that we have here? What would be your message? What would be your elevator pitch to them if you if you had the opportunity? Well, first, a brief response to the, the possible impacts of uh, climate change policies on conflict risk. And I think, yeah, Tobias already said part of it. I just wrote it. A uh, chapter for a book on the impacts of uh, climate adaptation policies on conflict risk, and then not only on violent conflict risk, but also, for example, on uh, risk in transboundary river basins, uh, upstream country implementing flood protection measures affecting water availability downstream. And I think there are so many, or I think I identified so many mechanisms in a way uh, that, or many mechanisms that can affect conflict risk and cooperation, not only affecting of violence, but also socioeconomic development possibilities. And there is, I think, already a broad literature on, or broad, there's already quite some uh, research on mal maladaptation. So uh, adaptation practices affecting or uh, advancing a specific group and not another. Uh, and I think we should really see uh, climate adaptation, but also mitigation as, a, as a, not something you do as well, but really as a big societal uh, systemic transformation, which affects all uh, sectors of society and in that way also the security sector and then very brief because I see we only have one minute and always take that long perspective into account as well. 
Thank, thank you very much, Sophie. I think we can get, if our participants permit us, we could get a little bit, five minutes over the time, if, if okay. So uh, now I will turn to, we can give the floor to Florian and uh, give, please give your final reflections. And also if you have any final recommendations to decision makers, your elevator pitch, what are the really the most important issues to, to follow up on? Um, well, my, my elevator pitch, um, a tough question, but I'd, I'd say uh, at the end of the day, um, for policymakers, get in touch with researchers, get in touch with agencies working on the issue. Um, for instance, Adelphi has been very involved um, in um, also consultations with the uh, German Federal Foreign Office, with uh, the United Nations, also with the UNEP, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, yeah, I think for policymakers, the important thing is get in touch with researchers, collect the evidence, um, see if you can get the knowledge um, or the research in the relevant places that will then help you to shape the outcome of, um, of your policies. Um, so I think, yeah, engagement would, would be my, my main um, takeaway. Thank you very much, Florian. And uh, Tobias, what, what is your main takeaway and what would be your main recommendations? Um, I mean, my main recommendation is have a look at and listen to the local evidence, um, just as the one Ben has given us, because if you want to have an impact on the ground, I mean, these large scale models and, um, and, 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 and let's say larger arguments we are forwarding as researchers can be quite helpful, but I'd always say in order to adapt them and tailor them to local needs and particularities and to avoid negative side effects um, of proposals that sound good on paper. Uh, you need to consult and talk to local people and be aware of the realities. And I think the presentation of Ben was a wonderful mm -hmm. example of that. Thank you very much, Tobias. And indeed, with that, we will give the final word to Ben. Ben, what would be your recommendation to policymakers? What is your main takeaway from this discussion? Okay, thank you so much. My main recommendation to policymakers is to take a holistic approach to management mm -hmm. of environmental issues, which are driven by climate change. I also recommend that uh, the refugee factor, which is as old as man in this world, should be given some priority when it comes to national and international uh, conversations. You will note that we have even the COP26, even the Rio Earth Summit, the, all these, you find that they don't factor in the refugee factor very much. And yet refugees are our brothers, they're our sisters, they're our parents who are quite vulnerable and who need a lot of uh, assistance. I should conclude by saying that these are the people who have nowhere to call home. Although they have two homes from where they came from their country and Kakuma, Kenya. These are also people who have nowhere to call my country, yet they have two countries one in the mother country and the other one is Kenya. I want also to note that these are people who have nowhere to run to because they have already, yet they have already run away from their country to Kenya here. So you find that these are vulnerable people, they have no options. And therefore it is my, my suggestion that the policymakers, both at national level, even in Kenya here, and even the international community, they should give a little bit more attention to the refugees. And above all, they should go to the preventive approaches of trying to maintain political stability in very globally so that the refugee issue does not continue growing at the rate at which it is growing because it is a, it is a, a big problem. And in the long run, you find that Refugees are therefore both victims as well as agents of environmental degradation and the climate change at large. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ben, for these uh, very important words. And with this, I would like to thank all the presenters and all the participants for a very interesting time. You, we shared the link. There is a plenary session at 3 p.m. We hope to see you there. And thank you very much for being with us. And we are all looking forward to seeing you uh, in at some uh, other events and uh, hopefully maybe in the future also we will be able to meet in person. So with that, I would like to wish you all a very nice day. Thank you and bye. Thank you. Thank you.